When you make a list of the best video game composers and a list of composers who are criminally underrepresented on this channel, the most egregious point of overlap has got to be Nobuo Uematsu. Known for scoring every Final Fantasy game up until 11, I would consider Uematsu to be right up there with Koji Kondo as the two pillars on which the entire culture of video game music rests. Basically, if Koji Kondo is video game Mozart, Nobuo Uematsu would be video game Beethoven. And like Beethoven, Uematsu's music feels meticulously crafted to the point where every note feels like it's been placed exactly where it's supposed to be. In an effort to try and incorporate some of Uematsu's talent and craftsmanship into my own compositions, I'm going to track him down, kill him, and eat his brain. I spent a few weeks transcribing, taking apart, and analyzing the soundtrack to Final Fantasy VI, one of the pinnacles of the RPG genre, and I want to share what I've found here over the course of a three video series. So strap yourselves in, and let's get started. The thing that interests me most about Uematsu's writing is that it is very obviously systematic, or follows a clear line of logic, without ever feeling forced or unnatural. When structuring a piece of music that follows a formula or sticks to an obvious line of thinking, the music can often sound lifeless, but Uematsu somehow manages to avoid this pitfall while still writing music that is very structured. For example, if we break down the theme for Terra, the main character of Final Fantasy VI, we can easily see the logic behind its composition. We start with the simple three note motif, a walk up from the root to the third of our tonic G sharp minor chord. This is the basic motif from which the rest of the entire piece is constructed. Uematsu embellishes the third with a quick jump up to the fifth of the chord and back, clearly outlining our tonic chord and establishing our first bar of music. So what should come next? We've just outlined our tonic chord, so from a classical point of view, the natural way forward would be the dominant chord, and that's what Uematsu gives us. We again use a pickup of two sixteenth notes to approach this jump down from the second to the fifth of the key, outlining our dominant chord and setting up a resolution back to our tonic. This is already such a well-written melody from a technical perspective. The shared rhythmic pickup to both ideas already creates some internal continuity. The clarity with which we've outlined the tonic and dominant chords creates forward momentum and allows the listener to easily make sense of what's going on. And the way the first bar rises contrasts how the second bar falls, creating a question and answer relationship within this one phrase. It's also worth noting that Uematsu harmonized this bar with a minor dominant chord rather than a dominant dominant chord. Okay, actually, hold on, I'm gonna call it the 5 chord. The use of a dominant 5 chord would have worked fine with this melody, which doesn't include either the minor or major third of the chord. But going for a 5 minor 7 chord instead creates a much softer sound. This is our first full phrase of the piece, and now that we've established it, we can see exactly how Uematsu uses this one phrase to generate the entire rest of the theme. Terra's theme is organized into A-A-B form, with both A and B sections being 8 bars long. The A section goes like this. We establish our main phrase, then we repeat the phrase as is, but displace the last note up an octave to create a sense of progression. This is the absolute least amount of variation he could use between the two phrases, with literally only one note in the whole arrangement being different, but it's just enough to give a sense that the music is moving forward. Next, the two-bar phrase is shifted up a third to the relative major key of B, a key so closely related that the key signature doesn't even change. Finally, we have a simple fall down from the third to the tonic, ending the section in a way that perfectly mirrors the way that we started it. Thank you. 
In Fundamentals of Musical Composition, Arnold Schoenberg writes, Intelligibility in music seems to be impossible without repetition. While repetition without variation can easily produce monotony, juxtaposition of distantly related elements can easily degenerate into nonsense. Only so much variation as character, length, and tempo required should be admitted. The coherence of motive forms should be emphasized. Uematsu perfectly exemplifies this practice in this theme. Even the B section, meant to extend the tune in a way that contrasts the A section, does so with the least amount of musical variation possible. He simply flips the order of events by playing the first two phrases in B major and the third phrase in G sharp minor. aspect of this melody germinated from the initial three-note motif, but as I said earlier, even though it's so obviously structured this way, it somehow feels authentic rather than forced. Uematsu was self-taught as a musician and a composer, so maybe the fact that he figured out this way of structuring his music on his own accounts for how it feels so organic rather than awkward, despite the formulaic nature of it. Let's take a look at a less straightforward example of the same idea with a tune that has a different kind of structure. Probably the most famous moment from Final Fantasy VI, and one of the most famous musical moments in video game history, is the beloved opera scene, in which ex gestalian General Celeste must impersonate an opera star on stage in an effort to get on board the ship of one of this star's degenerate otaku fanboys. The piece she performs on stage is Aria de Mezzo Caratere, which completely lifts the melody and harmony from Celeste's theme and rearranges it. Where Terra's theme is more blunt, being made up of short little call and response phrases that change the smallest amount possible to maintain forward momentum, Celeste's theme is a little more graceful, using longer melodic phrases and introducing new ideas at a much quicker rate without breaking up the flow of the piece. The theme is 16 bars long and split up into 4 bar phrases that follow a typical antecedent consequent formula. The first phrase establishes a musical statement, and the second phrase answers that statement in an inconclusive way. The third phrase is a repetition of the first phrase, and the final phrase answers this statement in a conclusive way. This is a super common structure for melodies that feels inherently satisfying to listen to. Inside this larger structure, each phrase follows a slightly different structure. We get a one-bar musical idea, followed by a variation of this idea, followed by an extended two-bar variation of the same idea to finish off the phrase. Let's look at phrase number one. The initial musical idea is this walk up from the third to the fifth of the key, which then plops down to the root. It's a simple idea that clearly outlines our tonic D major chord. The next bar gives us a variation of this idea that outlines our 3 chord, F sharp minor, by jumping up to a C sharp instead of dropping down to a D. This leap upwards nicely contrasts our previous leap downward, which is a common uematsu technique that we've already seen a few times throughout Terra's theme. The coolest part about this bar to me is this borrowed G sharp in the initial walkup. Moving to the 3 chord in a major key is commonly used to evoke a dark sound, which is appropriate as the singer at this point is lamenting her distant lover's probable death in battle. While keeping this walk-up diatonic to the key of D would totally work, Uematsu borrows this G-sharp note to temporarily put us in the key of F-sharp minor, making the outline of this 3 chord feel even darker and more serious than it otherwise would. It's a subtle distinction, but it shows the intense attention to detail that Uematsu applies to his work. The following variation changes a few things at once, making it a bigger leap than anything we saw in Terra's theme, but it's still recognizable as being based off of the initial melodic idea. We walk up from the 3rd to the 5th of our 4 chord, G, and then gently walk down to an A. This facilitates a resolution from G to D, which would kind of bring our phrase full circle, but Uematsu chooses to move back down to our 3 chord to emphasize the sorrow of our leading lady rather than give us a typical resolution.
So we have our first full phrase. Ending a phrase on the fifth of the key like this acts kind of like a springboard propelling the music into the next phrase, and as we move into this next phrase we're confronted with a new melodic idea. This suspension of the third of the chord that resolves down to the third and then gives us a little neighbor tone embellishment with the note below it. This new melodic idea is the basis for the second 4-bar phrase, the same way the first 4-bar phrase was all built off of this first melodic idea. The following bar moves the same melody down a step, keeping the semitone distance between the third of the chord and its lower neighbor note, even though this time it adds a little bit of colorful chromaticism. This chromatic neighbor tone actually turns out to be foreshadowing for the final two bars of the phrase. Again, we see the structure of a 4 to 3 suspension moving down to a lower neighbor tone embellishment, but this time it's stretched over two bars and harmonized with the secondary dominant C sharp chord, which preps yet another move to our 3 chord F sharp minor. I love that Uematsu wrote this piece in a major key, but kept borrowing notes from the key of the 3 chord, F sharp minor. It injects this really dark or sorrowful element to the music, but the piece being in a major key maintains this overall hopeful feeling about the situation, which comes to fruition as our heroine discovers her beloved Draco is still alive and coming to save her. How romantic. As I mentioned before, the last half of our melody here is largely a repetition of the first. The only difference occurs in the last two bars. Instead of temporarily tonicizing F sharp minor, Uematsu flattens these E and D notes to keep them in the key of D and nicely resolves to our tonic in the last bar. A very stable, classical way to end a melody, although it is undercut by this bittersweet, deceptive resolution from our 5 chord to the relative minor of the key, B minor. Let's listen to this whole half of the melody. This kind of super deliberate structure is what makes music intelligible to first time listeners, and while this is still a relatively simple melody, you can see the craftsmanship that goes into composing something this organized used for more complex pieces throughout the soundtrack. Next time we'll take a look at just how far Uematsu can stretch one motivic idea in different contexts. Check out my Twitter and my Patreon if you haven't already. Thanks so much for watching, and stay tuned for part 2 coming one week from today. I'll see you then.